In order to solve the mystery, you just had to think of the most ridiculous and outlandish thing that could have possibly happened. And that was usually what it ended up being. Welcome to Keep It Fictional, a weekly podcast for book lovers by book lovers. Build your to be read list with Sadie, Liz, Virginia, Fiona, and Kareen from the Port Moody Public Library. Warning. This podcast contains strong opinions and may cause an increase in your library holds list. All right, everyone, and welcome to Keep It Fictional, a book podcast for book lovers by book lovers from the Port Mini Public Library. I am your host, Kareen, here with my fellow book friends, Sadie and Virginia. And it's been a while since we have recorded a podcast episode. So how is everyone feeling? Are you like back in the podcasting saddle? Do you remember how to talk? No. See, it's so bad that Virginia is not even like answering. She's just like shaking her head, forgetting that this is like an audio medium. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> we're doing great. Thankfully, we have a great theme. I... I because I think I'm the one who chose it, to talk about this week that I think will assuage a lot of our guilt. So the worst email that I get every single year, and I get like a lot of emails that I don't love receiving, the one that's like, you really need to pay your taxes, or hey, this is your rent increase for the year, or other various emails that I don't love. But one of the most stressful emails that I get every single year is kind of nearing the end, let's say November. And this is the email that Virginia sends to all staff members at the library to have them send in to her their top books of the year. And you know, like choosing your favorite book is very difficult, but then you also have the added stress when you go through your like list of books, your Goodreads, and or your rather intense spreadsheets, and you realize that you actually haven't read that many books published this year. And then the real panic sets in. You're like, oh boy, I really have to in the next two to three weeks that Virginia gives us to kind of get our acts together to really concentrate on reading all the books that year that I meant to get to that I just didn't because things seemed so much more exciting or so much more shiny or for whatever reason that you didn't get around to all these new releases. And so this topic is to kind of give past us a little bit of grace, is to give us just like a, a little bit of like a little bit of a reprieve from the ominous specter of that email and that we are not choosing our favorite book of this year. Actually, we're not even choosing our favorite book of last year. We're just choosing a book that was published last year. One that we didn't get around to or that in this kind of like mad flurry towards the finish line of 2024, um, we're just focusing on all these releases. We're allowing ourselves to travel a little bit back in time to go back to a 2023 book which I thought would be quite easy because, of course, I always have a stack of library books at home until I started going through them and realized that they are all published in 2021, which was apparently a baller year for publishing the books that I just didn't get around to as I was frantically flipping through all these books saying, one of you has got to be published last year in a complete panic last night. Was it easy for you to pick a 2023 book to kind of like rescue one from the ashes of last year? This was actually a really great topic. I'd had like one one book that I really, really wanted to read last year and I didn't get to and it was like on my list and I knew I was going to read it eventually because I've, I've read everything else this author has written and I really like this author, but I just didn't get to it last year. So when I saw this topic, I'm like, you know what? That's what I'm going to do. I got the audiobook. I listened to it driving to and from work and it was actually a really, really easy assignment this time. See, I'm glad that someone enjoyed it. I'm glad that someone enjoyed the assignment. And like when I first chose this because Virginia gives us a lovely, great like spreadsheet list of topics to choose from. I really like this one because I usually don't get around to reading all of my 2023 ones. And honestly, because of the bad planning on my part, it was very easy to choose because again, it was one of the only ones in the stack that was published in 2023. Shout out to 2021. Great year. Great year. And then there was a bunch of books and translations that I was like, ooh, does this, does this count? 
Uh, I feel like it was published in 1967, so probably not. Um, and you know how closely that we hew to a theme here at Keep It Fictional, um, religiously following to the letter the theme that is dictated out to us. So at least two of us had a good time with this topic. One of us is like riddled, riddled with regret, which is what we love here. So I'm going to pass it over. Unfortunately, Sadie is trying not to make eye contact, so I'm going to choose her, which is my strategy whenever I'm doing anything. Um, so Sadie, what is the 2020, 2023? See, this is this is why I should not have been the host for this one. Everyone knows I have a problem with years and dates, and the the, the very date based theme is just in my lap. So get ready for a real time traveling episode. But Sadie, what is the 2023? book that you chose to read. I'm just curious um, how you avoid eye contact on Zoom. Because I mean, I, I just, I guess you, because I don't think I ever really look directly into the camera as as I don't think many people do. I feel like we often look at the videos of the people and of ourselves. And <clears throat> so, yes, just, just a curious question. Um, anyways, as I mentioned, this was a really great topic because I had a book that I wanted to read. And so when I got this topic, it just fits so perfectly. This author's books are often a little bit longer, so I didn't get a chance to fit it in last year. So yeah, it was perfect. So I ended up reading Homecoming by Kate Morton. And I uh, listened to the audiobook of this one, as I said, which was narrated by Claire Foy. And like most or all of Kate Morton's books, this book starts in the past. So Christmas Eve, 1959 in Adelaide Hills in Southern Australia. Outside the small town of Tambilla, local man Percy Summers stops at a creek and swimming hole to allow his horse to cool off. It's been a hot day, and Percy has been on the road since dawn, returning from clearing brush. He knows that he's now officially trespassing onto the Turner land. The land and the house is owned by Sydney man Thomas Turner and his English wife Isabel. However, Isabel has always told Percy that he is welcome to cut across their land anytime he wants. Percy and his wife Meg own the local grocery store, so they're often making deliveries up to the Turner house, and so they're friendly, and he knows that they won't mind if he walks across their land. So when Percy comes into the clearing by the swimming hole, he thinks they must all be sleeping. Their picnic is spread out around them. It's already eaten. The children, still damp from a swim in the creek. The baby, Thea, her basket is swinging lazily between two trees. However, the closer he gets, Percy realizes that Isabel Turner and her three oldest children aren't sleeping at all. They're too still, too quiet, and none of their chests are rising and falling with the presence of breath. Later, when the police ask him whether he saw baby Thea in her cradle, He honestly can't remember. He doesn't think he even went over to look. And so the search for baby Thea continues, and the police begin their investigation to figure out who could have possibly killed this whole family. Our story jumps ahead to 2018 in London. Jess Turner Bridges has lived in London for the past 20 years. She moved there from Sydney, where she once lived with her grandmother, Nora Turner Bridges. Jess is a journalist, and at one time, a pretty successful one. However, she's finding it harder and harder to sell her stories. Her latest long-term relationship ended, and while Jess knows that she doesn't really mind that her ex, Matt, is now expecting a child with his new girlfriend and is in a very successful career, she also knows that she has no idea where her life is going and whether she'll be able to afford her next mortgage payment, let alone the cab fare home in the pouring rain. However, Jess has recently pitched a story to a new editor, and she's hoping she'll get the call soon, saying that it's been accepted. However, when she jumps into the cab and her phone rings, it's not the editor that she was waiting for. It's a hospital in Sydney calling her as Nora's next of kin. Her grandmother suffered a fall trying to climb up to her attic and is now in the hospital. Nora is 89, and the hospital suggests that Jess may not want to delay a trip home. So Jess boards a plane and returns to Sydney in the house where she spent most of her childhood. When Jess arrives, she's plunged back into her childhood, drawing up memories from when she first came to her grandmother's house, or Darling House, as it's called. She was 10, 
and her mother Polly dropped her off to stay while Polly went to get their new house settled in Brisbane and start a new job. Jess was wary of Nora's house and excited about moving with her mother. However, she soon started to realize that Polly wasn't going to be coming back for her. And she wasn't, in fact, going to be moving with Polly to Brisbane. She was going to be staying with Nora. Jess was hurt and heartbroken. But over time, her and Nora became very, very close. Nora became Jess's biggest cheerleader and supporter throughout her teenage and adult years, while both of their relationships with Polly essentially disintegrated. Jess is concerned about Nora and tries to figure out why she was trying to go into the attic in the first place. She's even more worried after she visits Nora at the hospital, and Nora, finally having woken up, starts talking to Jess in a panicked voice about something called Halcyon and how she's not going to let him take her baby. Confused, but unable to get any answers from a very confused Nora, Jess starts doing her own research. What she finds is a connection to the Turner family of Adelaide Hills. The house they lived in, called Halcyon, the terrible tragedy that befell the family on Christmas Eve, and how Nora Turner Bridges, sister of Thomas Turner and sister-in-law to Isabel Turner, had been visiting the family for Christmas, heavily pregnant with baby Polly, and had lived through the whole horrible tragedy, given birth prematurely and had to deal with the aftermath of the police investigation and discovery that Isabel Turner poisoned her three children and then herself. Jess is shocked. Her grandmother had never mentioned Isabel or anything about living through such a horrible event. Jess knew that Nora had at one time been very close with her brother Thomas, who was, as far as Jess knew, lived in England with his family until he died when Jess was a child. But Nora never said that he had been married before or had ever had any other children. When Nora's condition takes a turn for the worse, Jess is even more determined to find out about the Turner family and why Nora was so focused on them all of a sudden and why she's so concerned about a baby being taken away. We see many different perspectives in this book. Jess in 2018, Percy Summers in 1959, flashbacks and memories of Jess and Polly at different stages in their lives, much of the story is told through a book that Jess finds under her grandmother's pillow called As If They Were Sleeping, written by journalist turned author Daniel Miller, who had been reporting on the Turner tragedy and police investigation in 1959. As the story goes on, more and more pieces are revealed, and we start to see a fuller picture of what exactly happened on that hot summer day in 1959, what happened in the days and weeks following the tragedy, and how this is all connected to Nora and Polly and eventually Jess. This book very much follows the Kate Morton formula, which is quite comforting in a way. I feel like when you pick up a Kate Morton book, you know exactly what you're going to get. There's going to be multiple perspectives. There's going to be some tragedy in the past that's resurfacing decades later, some sort of wild mystery that you're trying to solve. And honestly, the books are always an enjoyable read. And this one didn't disappoint in that sense. I used to joke after reading, I don't remember which one of hers, but one of her older books that in order to solve the mystery, you just had to think of the most ridiculous and outlandish thing that could have possibly happened. And that was usually what it ended up being. And so this is a little bit like that, but I mean, it, it is still enjoyable to read. It's still fun to kind of go back and forth between the times and, and see if you can figure out what's going on. I do have to say that in this one, more than others, I ended up really hating one of the characters in the book. I don't know if that was intentional, but I think that as more and more is revealed, the, the character is not at all what you think they are. And the choices that they have made kind of through the years come out quite a bit more in a way that that I did not agree with in a lot of ways. Um, so I ended up not really liking this person by the end of the book. But despite that, I think this book is exactly what it said it would be and exactly what I hoped it would be when I picked it up. 
<laughs> so if you are looking for something, if you like Kate Morton and you're wanting to kind of see see her latest book and you enjoy her style of writing, or I'd say if you're a fan of Lucinda Riley or Susanna Kearsley or Sarah Jo, then they're all kind of similar, similar authors, similar ideas where you're you have a character in the in the present day looking back and you're seeing the perspectives from kind of these multiple, multiple time periods. Then yeah, I think that Homecoming would be a great pick for you. Yeah, I really enjoyed it and I'm glad I finally got to read it. So thank you, Corrine, for picking this topic. You're welcome. And yeah, I I honestly enjoy Kate Morton because it really is. You're like, oh, it, the, you have that like fleeting moment when you're reading it of like, oh, well, that no, obviously it wouldn't be that. And you're like, oh, oh, it is, it is that. It is, it is that. Okay, that was fine. That was fine. I am like so desperate to know like which character you really didn't like like was it one of the main characters it was have have you read it Corinne? i know you have read some paper or no yeah uh yes no it was one of the the main characters i i'm i'm happy to tell people it was it was nora i was her grandmother yeah yeah she's she makes some choices she makes some choices and uh they affect a lot of people like and obviously don't say anything with your face because we don't want to do spoilers but like poisony choices okay interesting yeah hmm Huh. Interesting. 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 I yeah, I do enjoy Kate Morton. I think the one that I did not enjoy as much was the one where one of the main POVs was a ghost. Bellwether? Was that Bellwether? Might have had something to do with a watchmaker. Oh, oh, the clock clockmaker's daughter. Yeah, I don't I don't remember well that much. I've read them all, but I don't <laughs> that might be telling. It's just, you know, like when a person is a ghost, you're pretty sure you know the end of their story. There's not like a ton of suspense in there that you can do with that, with that. I'm going to ask Virginia Gypsy because I want to see your facial expression when I do this. And apologies to people who listen to this podcast. Virginia, have you ever read a Kate Morton book? Of course not. What do you, what do, what do you, what did you expect? Of course not. Do I plan to? Of course also not. So yeah. Just thought I would ask, you know, you know. Well, thanks for including me in the conversation. <laughs> See, the problem is with like three people, it would be very awkward if I just left you out of this conversation as like Sadie and I went off on a Kate Morton. Because Sadie and I do have like that Venn diagram overlap of like stories where one of them is in the past and one of them is in the present, like because it's just fun. But it that is tough when you genuinely like hate one of the main characters. You're like, oh, good. Back with you. And I mean, like, luckily, it it like slowly comes out. So you don't hate her the whole time. Like I said, I don't know if it was intentional because like there's some very deliberate things that she does and you just like as more information is being released, like, are you, am I supposed to really dislike you? I mean, that's like a, that's a, a, a bigger thing of making a very unlikable character or starting with an, a likable character and then making them horribly unlikable as the story goes on as one of your POV characters to kind of pull that off as a writer is tough because you don't want to feel at the end of the story, well, I I feel betrayed. Like I spent all this time with this person and they turned out to be real jerk. So that that is an interesting kind of interesting departure from Kate Morton because I feel like usually her characters, like they make bad choices, but you understand why they're making those bad choices and you're like okay fine like abandon your child in the garden and walk away like i guess but yeah to make someone like unlikable and sympathetic at the beginning and then slowly reveal that that they're that's a that's a tough thing virginia can you think of any books that kind of pull that off well unless you're like an actual villain right like you know there's a lot of those that like you know they try to make it like you know you're not supposed to like them but yet you do end up like you know i feel like that was one of our supposedly one of our topic which we never did it it reminds me okay and spoiler alerts for the merger of roger Ackroyd by agatha christie has anyone read that one okay so this is like one of the most controversial books in like the mystery canon like golden age mystery canon and it's because this, you know, a very simple, cozy murder mystery written by Agatha Christie. We kind of know what we're getting into. It's a it's a Poirot. So we're like, OK, I, I understand the structures. I understand what's going on. And occasionally in Agatha Christie murder mysteries, there's a different POV character who's like commenting on the mystery. And then the, the detective kind of comes in. And so you go along with your main character. And, and it kind of goes through and he's kind of helping Poirot investigate. And you're like, OK, cool. Like, let's let's get to the bottom of this. And then at the end, 
It turns out that our narrator, who has been helping investigate the crime, is the murderer. And people either love this and think that it's very, very clever, or they're like, they're furious because it's like a giant screw you to the reader of like playing with the conventions of the genre where you take someone who is very likable and at the beginning of the story they're wonderful and you're like i'm invested in you i'm really happy for you are you going to find love and at the end you find out they're a stone cold murderer and they've been lying to poirot the entire time which is so unacceptable so yeah pulling that that off and making you not angry at the end like do, does Kate Morton pull that off I don't know I mean I think that like there's a lot of choices that this character makes throughout like their entire life and that affect a lot of different people and some of them I think are completely understandable some of them I I get and then there's some and and maybe it's just like me maybe it's just the choices that they make that that I just don't think that that like when you take someone else's life and you completely change what it was going to be and their perception of the other people in their life because of a choice that you have essentially pushed onto them, it just, I struggle with that. And so I think like maybe, maybe that's why maybe it wasn't supposed to be a decision that made you hate her. But I just, I think that you're, maybe you're not supposed to feel as sympathetic towards her as as it comes across at the beginning. And maybe that is intentional that you kind of see her as a flawed person and a flawed character and you're able to kind of see, see that change, but it just, I don't know. It. I don't think so because if she set up at the beginning of like, Oh, it's your dying grandma all alone in Australia. You need to come and help her. Like she set up as like an ultimate sympathy character. And then. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. It's interesting. So I, yeah. Curious if anyone else has read it and it's <laughs> the same way. Yeah, get back to us, Kate Morton. Explain your methodology. Explain your thoughts. All right. Um, I'm going to go next, just before I forget this book, because again, as mentioned, I stayed up really late reading this one. I was reading another book, one that was not published last year, and so kind of shot my foot. And when I realized at midnight, I was like, oh, what a good book. And then I was like, oh, boy, I'm out of practice. It's Thursday night. So again, I looked through all of my books and picked out one that was published last year and that I ended up really enjoying. So I'm quite pleased with that because if I had to stay awake up until like three o'clock in the morning, I would have hoped it was worth my time. So this is about Maximum Medium Claire. She is a 30-something burnt out millennial with a history degree, which has been so, so useful in the job market. She is self-employed. And her only customer right now is her old university friend, Biggie Wellington Forge. And Claire has been hired to come down to Biggie Wellington Forge's fancy country house in the middle of nowhere for a family soiree. It's her Nana's 80th birthday party. And so Claire has been brought there. She has been hired to provide the entertainment. Now, Claire never goes anywhere without her bestie. This is Sophie. They have been best friends since they were teenagers, and she always travels with Sophie. And so the two of them are on this train to the middle of nowhere in a country house in England for a birthday party. And I think we all know where this is going because you should never celebrate anything in an old country house where there is like an elderly person who's thinking of selling the land in order to make money. And then all the family is gathered there with like different motivations. Mistake. So anyways. Claire shows up to this crumbling country manor. She meets Nana, who's lovely. She meets Uncle Basher, who is an ex-police officer. She meets Alex, the 18-year-old nine non-binary fashion icon. She meets Monty and Tristan, who work in the city in finance. Um, she meets Clementine, who's kind of a menace in the kitchen and debones chickens in a way that is deeply threatened. And she meets a bunch of people with names like you pretty much expect, like, Tuppence, Tremaine, lots of British things. And Claire has been hired to entertain this family for the weekend as they gather for this birthday party. And what entertainment does Claire provide? Well, Claire is a medium. She talks to ghosts. Mostly she talks to one ghost, which is her best friend, Sophie. Sophie passed away when she was 
only 17 years old in the 20s, and she is perpetually stuck at 17. When she was 17, she disappeared. No one was able to find her until one day she appeared at Claire's side at one of her wakes. Sophie doesn't remember what happened to her. She knows something bad happened, and she knows that she is dead. But in many ways, Claire has been able to hold on to her best friend. And so they are somehow tethered and linked together for all time. Which comes in really handy for Claire's job, because if she really needs to convince someone that they are, you know, legit, she just sends Sophie to kind of like ghost through walls and kind of take a little rifle through their things. And Sophie really enjoys doing that. The two of them really enjoy watching true crime documentaries together, and so they kind of use this to their advantage. As they are at this crumbling house and family secrets are coming out, something rather tragic happens. Nana, on her 80th birthday, dies. But not under mysterious circumstances. She just, like, straight up dies. But as she has a little unfinished business, she stops to talk to Claire and Sophie. She says, I think someone in my family has killed someone. Claire and Sophie exchange a look. Um, well, Nana, why do you think that? Oh, well, you know... On my way out to the garden as a ghosty spirit, um, I met another ghost in the library who seems pretty upset at being murdered. Anyways, that is your problem now. My business here is finished. Peace. And Nana goes off to the great beyond, leaving Claire and Sophie with a mystery to solve. For sure enough, in the library, there is a fresh and gooey spirit who is very, very upset at being murderated. So it is up to Claire, her ghost friend Sophie, to join kind of forces with the only two members of the family who are definitely not murderers, Uncle Basher and Alex, to form a kind of horrible, drunken, Scooby-Doo quad to try and solve this mystery. Sophie, for herself, is very excited to have something to do. Claire is very thrilled to put all of her crime show knowledge into place. Uncle Basher thinks they're all crazy, and Alex, an 18-year-old, is delighted by all of this. They come together in a terrible, terrible Scooby-Doo moment, which turns out to be a mixture of kind of like Midsummer Murder ghosts, the TV show where there's all the ghosts in the manor that talk to the people who run a hotel, and girls. Because Claire, oh, Claire two o'clock in the morning and my bed just going, oh, lay off the cider and make better decisions in a very funny, very irreverent, very fun little mystery. The debut novel by Alice Bell, which is Grave Expectations. The sequel has also just come out that I will actually read. This is very fun, very funny. And if you're a big fan of like true crime and the mystery genre, it is a lovely send up for it. Alice Bell is a kind of like video game journalist and writes in a very pithy, very funny style. And the mystery was kind of like, good enough. Good enough. It was fine. It was fine. It was fine. Mostly, I just really loved Sophie the Ghost, the millennial who says, LOL. Don't know why that made me laugh, but it was two o'clock in the morning and it was really funny with all of her little like butterfly clips in her hair and like all of her beautiful slang of being 17 years old. It's actually like a really cute found family story of they're all going to like join forces and like make a detective agency together, which really kind of like stoked my Nancy Drew, my Nancy Drew energy. So I really enjoyed this. I think this is a wonderful debut. It's fun. It's a little bit of a mystery, and it's very, very funny in the way kind of like a Maureen Johnson book is. Someone who really understands the genre and is just kind of playing a little bit with it, plus ghosts. Plus ghosts. I'm really glad that I picked this up. I'm really glad for this topic. And I'm really, really glad that it was published in 2023. Real handy for me. <laughs> All right. So yeah, that's my pick. That's my pick. So again, we're doing this. We're, we're happy with things. Virginia, you had a lot of angst on this topic. How did how did you land on which books to choose? 
Well, I mean, despite the angst and the anxiety, I am glad that I get to like have an incentive to tackle one of the books. And the one that I ended up picking wasn't really even on my radar until it won the uh, National Book Award last year. And it's one of those awards that like very few awards that I care about. And I only care about it ever since they gave it to Interior Chinatown, of course. And that's why that award is now like great. I have to say ever since 2020, when that award was given to Interior Chinatown, I have read every single winner since then, and they have all been great. I think I love three out of four of them. The other one I like, but maybe like not love as much. Spell, 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 I think it's also a, maybe a coincidence. So this may be a completely inaccurate assessment is that I feel like this award does reward authors who are willing to take a risk. It does give it to stories that really stretch out definition of like what a story is and how we can tell a story. And, and that seems to be sort of the, the pattern that I have at least in the four, last four years. It seems to be that. And so I was quite excited to read last year's winner, which is Blackouts by Justin Torres. And it did not disappoint at all. I think if I read it last year, it would definitely have made it into one of my top five books. That is how good it is. I also realized that, of course, I'm going to regret picking this book because this book fits our next week's topic perfectly in every way, including the title. So, uh, yeah, okay. I might have to talk about this book again next week. What was I thinking? Um, there's so many 2023 books I could have picked. Anyway, so this book is about a 27-year-old, our unnamed narrator, who has used up most of his money to take a bus to a place called the Palace. This is the name of a decrepit building in what the book described as in part of a desert, even though I don't think it's really in a desert. And he's here to find a man named Juan. Juan is a much older man than our narrator and that our narrator has spent some time with more than 10 years ago when they were both institutionalized. Juan is dying and before he dies, he wants to pass on a project that he has been working on all his life to our narrator. And this is a project to uncover the true story of Jan Gay. Jan Gay is a researcher and she has spent all her life gathering stories and interviewing other gay people, other lesbians. And she hopes to publish a book with all these stories in them. Unfortunately, at the time, you don't get published unless you're a white heterosexual man. So it pains her to do so, but she realizes and she knows that the only way that these stories can be out there for people to read is if she finds a white guy who will put his name on the book. So in 1941, a two-volume book titled Sex Variants Study in Homosexual Patterns was published by author Dr. George W. Henry. And of course, when Jan Gay read her book, her book, all her work has been presented in a completely different lens than what she intended. At that point, there was a strong need in the medical field to pathologize homosexuality. And all the people that she talked to basically end up serving as examples of how homosexuality, like any disease, like any mental health issue, are acquired. There's behavior that can be changed. You can unlearn it. And there's a cure for all of this. And so all her work and, and all the intents of her work has been erased and appropriated. So Juan has spent his life trying to get to this real story and he knows he's dying. So he's hoping to pass this on to our unnamed narrator. And one of the things that he passed on is a copy of Sex Variants, but his copy has a lot of lines and a lot of things that are black out, hence sort of the title of the book. And so it provides a completely different sort of view of the book. And so throughout the story, we watch our narrator and Juan trading stories about their lives. And we, we learn a little bit more about them, of course, in addition to learning more about Jan Gay and her work. And it is this act of sharing stories that sustain both of them. It's almost like our narrator's stories about himself, about his life, about his relationships, sexual and non-sexual relationships that he has had, that sort of keeps one alive kind of one day at a time. 
And since Juan is on his deathbed, very often the, our narrator has reminded him, hey, it's your turn to tell your story. We want to learn a little bit about you also. And you can see that reciprocal effect that Juan's story has on our narrator, this older gay man who our narrator sees as a model, as, as, as a mentor. And and he's looking to Juan for recognition, for acceptance, so that he can understand more about himself and his place in the world. And he thinks that Juan can provide that for him. And of course, this theme of continues in their project as they learn more about Jen Gay and all the people that she interviewed. We learn about why Jen Gay's story is important. And we learn about how all these stories have been erased and been usurped that happen so frequently throughout history are not forgotten and that the new generation inherit all those experiences and make them live on. And I love the idea that the the copy of sex sex variants that they got is blackout because what this person did, you know, like is to this very, very clinical, probably very, we, we don't know because you can't see all the words, but they're all blackout and, and presumably a very like clinical account of all these interviews and all these stories of these people. And in that act of like, I'm blacking out this clinical account, blacking out certain parts of the text. We kind of regain the power. We, we return this power to all the queer folks that Jen Gay interview and then Jen Gay hang out with. And we use that same weapon to reclaim and to restore what's theirs. And it was just really wonderfully done. I feel like Blackout is like, you read like a, a very long like hallucination and it's very dreamlike throughout the thing. And, you know, that's that's my kind of book. And not only do we get like sort of uh, the stories between our narrator and Juan, the stories that they exchange, and it was always described in different forms. Their lives are described differently. Sometimes, you know, they're like, oh, let's do it like a screenplay or let's do it like, you know, when we tell it in reverse. So it's a very sort of different, long linear way of telling the stories of the two of them. But there's also a lot of photos photographs and illustrations included in the uh, story that you can kind of get ideas of like what should try to piece together what this story is all about. And all of them were explained in the notes in the book at the end of the book, but it's not really like a scholarly kind of like pr just providing the source of these photos, but it's also like peppered with a lot of the narrator's thoughts and, and his interpretation of what actually happens. So you get a bit of that. And then there's a lot of references to art, lots of references to other books um, in this book that you have to kind of decipher. And then you, you kind of have to have like kind of Wikipedia, like kind of beside you, you know, like just try to, you know, look things up as as you are kind of, as things are mentioned. And then of course we get the excerpts from, from the book Sex Variant. So you you get all the blackout bits and you read about the lives of these people and, and how wonderful they are because like the, the parts that are what this, this, these doctors are trying to do have been erased. And then, of course, another layer for the book is that like there are a lot of uh, characters that are actually real people, you know, maybe have a different name. So, you know, you kind of find that out, you know, in, in the book there. And so there's a lot of facts and fiction all mixed together. Um, so you're never really quite sure what's real and what's not. And, and I love sort of just that combination. This is definitely for me, probably the right book to start with Justin Torres. His debut novel, We the Animals, is probably more I'm assuming sort of more popular and, and it's supposed to be a little bit more straightforward. It's been made into a movie, I believe. I would love to for everybody to pick up Blackouts, but I understand that this may not be sort of the book for everybody just because of the way the structure of the of the story is. So I, I hope that you will still pick up a Justin Torres book, pick up Be the Animals if you're looking for a little bit more of a straightforward story and give you just that's that's kind of this kind of story that you prefer. It would be a great choice for Prime Month. But if you are willing to to try to piece together a story, give you like sort of things that are convoluted, I would highly, highly recommend Blackout by Justin Torres. Honestly, because it won the National Book Award and because of Interior Chinatown, right? Like, and that was a book that I, I think like played, as, as you said, like they really do reward that kind of like experimentation in a way that a lot of other book awards maybe don't that are going for just kind of like straight prose. And I feel like sometimes the National Book Award is like more about the storytelling than it necessarily is the prose. Not to say that the prose isn't beautiful, but it, it really does kind of narrow down on like the how you tell the story. Hmm. Okay, which is the one you really didn't like? Oh, no, no, they're all, I, I love three of them. And the other one was okay. Like, I like it, but it's okay. Name names, Virginia. No, no, you, you figure it out. I have a hunch. I have a hunch. 
I have a hunch. It's not that hard to figure. There are only four choices. It's not that hard to figure it out. I have a hunch. Honestly, that does sound really good. <laughs> yeah, really good if you're kind of in the right mood. All right. Well, I, thank you all for taking like a journey through time to six months ago <laughs> and, and giving us kind of like more stress when we get that email in November of like, oh, Oh, that book was so good. It just missed out. Um, but maybe for uh, our what do you what do you what do you call that when we do our best books of 2024? You get like special honorable mentions that we just kind of like sneak in really fast. Maybe you will see some of these on this list. So do we need to do a book publish in 2024 episode just so that we can make us read? <laughs> just so that we have at least one? <laughs> yeah, not a bad idea at all. Would really appreciate. Would really appreciate. Because again, 2021 has apparently been my sweet spot. Every single book I've read, I'm going through because I'm like, it's mid-year and I'm like almost in a little bit of like, oh, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. It's, you're running out of time here. You're running out of time. It's halfway through the year. You need to get on top of this. Um, but again, I'm stuck in 2021. So yeah, maybe if we do one of those and then we could do best of 2021. Celebrate so that year. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much for uh, all of our listeners and watchers. Watchers? Do people watch us? I hope not. I didn't brush my hair this morning. Thank you to all of our viewers and watchers. I will brush my hair later for joining us in this kind of like journey through time. I uh, We hope that within these three books, you found something that you really enjoyed. Definitely check out The Murder of Roger Ackroyd and see how you feel about that. Um, and this is be like a weird episode of Keep It Fictional because I feel like I'm actually going to read both of the books that you talked about. But maybe wait until next year so that you can read some 2024 books. You're so right, Sadie. I have got to be strategic about this. So thank you so much for everyone. Um, happy reading in this year or the next year or the year before. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please tell a fellow book lover about it. You can find a list of all the books we discussed in our show notes. Join us next week for another fun book chat. Until then. Keep it fictional.